Uh, the escape routes are located <laughs> at the back. Uh, some people are in this. You know, it's interesting. I teach at Walsh University in North Canton, Ohio. I'm a 1975 graduate of Cal Lutheran. And uh, I grew up in Western Pennsylvania. So for me, it was coming to college here. And then um, I wanted to go home and be by family. But uh, my love for this institution has never waned. And the value of what I got from this being able to go to school here. Um, I uh, was class president, and I'm currently serving as the alumni rep for my class and just put a piece of the alumni magazine. Uh, I thought that was something I should get involved in when you're looking for someone, even though I live 2,500 miles away. So I hope those of you who are students value your opportunity here to take advantage of it because you'll get out of it what you do. All right, so first of all, this is a disclaimer. <laughs> I do tell people this. Um, that sign actually has blinking lights on it. Uh, when I travel by car, I take it with me. That hangs outside the room. I'll be at the International Lily Conference at Miami University in November, and they will ask me when they get there, did you bring your sign? Uh, I'm known for my sign. But um, if you aren't fun and you're looking for extreme seriousness, I probably will offend you. I apologize ahead of time. You know, but as my wife, as I tried to end comedy, I said, there's one person in the world who does not think I'm funny, and that is my wife. So she will agree with you. So, um, that proves that I got a degree here. Huh? I'm giving it up. Let's go. <laughs> My high school guidance counselor told me I shouldn't go to college because I didn't pay attention to the right things, I asked too many questions, and I was disobedient at times. Um, all of those things were true. <laughs> I credit for knowing a little bit. Uh, that's what I looked like in 1975 when I was actually taking the, in the fall for my senior year. Um, they were so shocked that I was having a senior picture taken at my mother's request. Um, my mother had to buy me a coat and tie. Uh, this was coming off the Vietnam War. So we didn't have a lot of coat ties back then, but um, they put my picture up at some photography studio down by what used to be there, the mall still there or not, um, by the freeway, because they hadn't had anybody from the college take a picture. So that was my roommate with me in Kingston Park. Uh, just trying to let you know, he is, I have a picture to show you what we look like now. Um, the two men at the top of me, uh, this is Dave Mankiville, he graduated in 75. Steve Lafferty left. Steve went to UCSB to get a program he wanted that was a little different they didn't have here. He was here for two years. He's currently the lead um, attorney for Creative Arts Agency in um, Hollywood. One of his clients who just went and created her own company was Oprah. And uh, we met last February. Um, Greg Keno was very active in the class of 76. And then John was here for two years, same thing. He wanted to go into engineering and it wasn't an option for him at that time. But um, those were my first set of roommates, and I was this sort of regular kid. They all went, most of them lived in Pacific Palisades at one time, so it was a little different. I just put that picture in because I took it this summer. I think it's a cool picture of the Grand Canyon. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now here's, so, so, this is part of the thinking process. In September 2013, I was with two other graduates of Cal Lutheran. Skip Piaszczynski has the blue shirt on. He graduated in 1976. Bob Nelson graduated in 75. Um, we all played football. So, you're supposed to think right now, what were our roles in the football team? One person was a quarterback, one person was a center, and one person was a receiver. So as you sit there and think who it might be, here is the answer. Bob Nelson, the yellow shirt, was the quarterback, I was the center, and Skip was a receiver. Uh, the reason I was a center is because the real freshman center was moved to the varsity. I had played center in high school when some kids got hurt. I went to a small country school, and no one else could figure out how to do it. The coach said, we're going to make you the center. Um, I got here. No one could snap the ball. And I said, hey, I'll do it if I get to play. Um, in spite of two hospital stays, that was not a good decision on my part. But I did elevate myself, though. By the time I was a senior, I came back out, and I was a scout team tailback. And for those of you who don't know what that means, I pretended to be the other team's player during practice during the week. I didn't play on Saturdays, but I got to wear a nice uniform and cheer from the sidelines, and we were good. So I wanted you to know what it looks like back east this month. Um, this is a tree outside my, my, that's looking in my street at my neighbors, across the street at my neighbors. This is Traverse City, Michigan. 
And uh, Traverse City sits on one of the fingers of lakes that comes down from Lake Michigan. Uh, it's one of the things I missed about my upward roots of the east was what the colors looked like this time of year back there. Um, I want you to know I was not an innocent when I was here. Uh, I am this long-haired fellow here. Uh, this item in my, does anybody know what that is? Fire extinguisher. Yes, that is a fire extinguisher. Uh, we thought for Yam Yad, that is Dave Nankinville, he also has a fire extinguisher, that it would be a good idea to borrow fire extinguishers from Mount Clef Hall and use them to squirt water on people. Uh, apparently the dean did not think so, nor did the fire marshal, since that was front page in the Conejo Valley News the next day. <laughs> My one chance at fame in California, and that happened. Uh, you may have had Professor Six Squirts. He was my advisor. Um, I, as a, a person, he inspired me to be better than I thought I could be. That's what he looked like in 1973, and that was in February when I came out and visited. Um, and he has remained a friend of mine for the 44 years I have known him. So, class officers, 1975, I was class president. The woman here. That is Barbara Borneman. She's today Pastor Barbara Borneman, and her dad's name is on the building that houses the education and some other things. Um, that is Pastor David Beard. I don't know what we did. Somebody went into the clergy, but they did. Chris Grudy is not Chris Kirkpatrick. She is a very active person in the sacramental area. Blood dries for the cross, and then I became a teacher. That's Dr. Jack Ledbetter, and um, he was our class advisor. I think. I don't know what they have in those glasses. Um, I'm sure that that's all they had to drink water from. <laughs> of course. So Jerry Miller, Just How Things Work Association, former president. Jerry grew up in Salem, Ohio. He graduated from Salem High School. He was the alumni a year at year one point in time. He attended Trinity Lutheran Church. And I met him when they announced Jerry Miller, the former the president of Cal Lutherans in church today. Because I live in Salem, and I was the superintendent of the schools there. So that goes around. And if you know Dr. Brennan, we both got our PhDs at Kent State, and actually we were there at the same time. Different departments, it's a big place. So connections can happen in lots of different places. Um, yes, that is Pope Francis. Some Walsh students were on study, were doing a study abroad in Rome. They made a sign, they went to the Vatican City. They said, hey, would you take a picture with our sign? He said, okay. And in marketing, <laughs> Where's our marketing person? <laughs> marketing sometimes is good planning and sometimes is blind luck. <laughs> That's the blind luck. Walsh has milked that picture quite a bit. So, all right. Is there any this to learn here? I put these things up because I did very specific things before you came. How many notes are a music plan when you came in? I don't teach a class that I don't play something before the class starts. Every single class. It causes a mindset of trying to get people in a good mood to come in and you're sort of surly or a little bitter about something, we want to try to change that. I had some laughter. It's just trying to get some things. I'm trying to tap into your limbic system. Your limbic system is your emotional center in your brain. And I'll show you some things that's cool about that. So that's what I have here. It's sort of positive images. These are some of the books that I took the stuff from for those of you that are academics. By the way, there is a handout available after the session electronically or it can be printed for you. You're not going to be able to use it while you're here. I'm going to have you doing things. So if you want it, you can get it from Sia or from Beth. And if you want it electronically, they can email it to you. Or if you need it printed, it can be printed for you. But it does explain the stuff. Um, currently, I have um, a research article to Metasynthesis of Active Learning Pedagogies and Whole Brain Teaching that has been, it's now under consideration by IGA Publishing for a chapter in a book on improving college teaching. We're supposed to hear by October 31st if we're included or not. I couldn't print it because I signed an exclusivity agreement, but I wouldn't share it until they either accept or reject. Once they accept, there's some things we can do. If they reject them, it's my work again. But we can back it on. Everything I'm going to show you is somebody out there has done the research that ties into these things. Excellent book by Todd Zakrasik and Terry Doyle on active learning. Uh, how many students are in here? Okay, I'm going to give you a couple of things that are absolutes. Exercise causes you to learn more. Proper hydration causes you to learn more. If I went to school in Thousand Oaks, California, where it's 95 degrees in October, drink water. <laughs> Sleep matters. 
Time between classes matters. If you take a class that ends at 10 o'clock and you jump into a class at 10.20 or 10.15, you have not had enough time to process. Your brain's still working on that first class. Sometimes we schedule classes. And how about K-12? I did that for a long time. We give them three to four minutes between classes. <laughs> We're pretty much guaranteed the second class, they're not going to remember the first 15 minutes. So just some things that are in this book about that. Uh, that's, I did woodwork, and that's one of my pieces behind it. Cognitive Classroom is another excellent choice. Um, you might want to take a look at that. This is James Record. He is a professor at the University of New Hampshire. Um, a lot of the gestures and stuff that I'll be showing you, um, he reinforces in his book. So I don't read these things um, to you. I only said the last one to have some fun today. <laughs> Just try to have fun. If you aren't going to have fun, or you're not a fun person, this is really important. Joseph. Yes, sir. Fake it. <laughs> Because your brain doesn't know the difference between fake fun and real fun. So if you fake the fun, your brain will think you're having fun. And that's, that's not made up. That's a real fact. So here's some things we're going to do. Idea testing. I'm not going to go over these. You look at them. This is James Zoll, Case, Case Western Reserve University. Your brain tests ideas. Um, for those of you that are not students, anybody here a parent? Anybody in here a parent have more than one child? Did you test things on your first child? <laughs> Did you not do the same things to the second child? <laughs> Our brains will test ideas. If it doesn't work, we throw them out. We keep what works. We throw out what doesn't work. So if you see something today that you like, test the idea, play with it, and see if it works for you. And some of the other stuff we'll get to. The value of positivity. Uh, this is Barbara Fredrickson out of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. In the value of what positivity does, we do know that if you are in a good mood and treated well, your body will release endorphins that will help you learn more. We also know that stress releases cortisol. Cortisol is what protects you from danger. It's that feeling you get when you're scared and your heart pounds really hard. That's not my learning mode, by the way. Because when our ancestors were running from saber-toothed tigers, the intellects turned around and said, interesting, look at the teeth on that animal. I wonder if I can create a pet. You know, that was his last passing thought. <laughs> so we have cortisol to protect us in a stress situation where a coercive teacher embarrasses a student or does other things or threatens the classroom, is going to cause a release of cortisol, a reduction in learning will be the outcome. Getting something to think about is kind of be funny. Basically, talk is cheap. If you are an action give, taker and you don't know why you're taking action, you might tread water. If you think and talk about stuff and never do anything, no progress is made. But people who actually think and try things and put it into action, we get results. And that's part of what we're going to try to do. So, first thing, take a look at these two women. Can you tell what kind of learners they are from the picture? I was doing a piece today about behaviors, and the first thing we see about people with behaviors, but you have an image up there. Would anybody give me an idea of what you think they might do? It's a setup, I will tell you that, but no. Please. They're athletic. Okay, they might be athletic. What else? Confrontational. Could be confrontational type people. What else do they look like? What might they like doing? Yeah, they, somebody said, don't they look like motorcycle chicks? Yeah, good. All right, the reality is that they were attending a child's pirate party. The one on the left is my daughter, Sarah. She's finishing dinner, dental school this year. The one on the right is my daughter, to your right, is my daughter, Melissa. She is a vocal instructor at, the Ohio, at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. Um, both are really good students. Um, Melissa went to the Eastman School of Music. Sarah's a graduate of Wake Forest and soon to be UNC's dental school. How about these children? This is Uganda. Walsh has a sister campus in Uganda, so I wanted to use this picture. Can we tell what those kids are like? Question. Endorphins releasing that are positive, or does this look like a stress picture? <laughs> positive. Positive. All right, so we can create this. Average class size in Uganda, by the way, is 75 or bigger. And it's, we're trying to get them to do it. It's a lecture-based system, but if they can get to school, they do want to learn. And there's a big hit on the All their computers are under lock and key because the criminals steal computers. 
Um, they have to, when we get them, send them computers, we actually have to design the cages that they'll be used in because they have to have people on bicycles running generators because they don't have electrical feeds um, in order to use a computer. We do that for exercise, they do it for reality. So I want to explain, this is a piece on expressiveness. I have a strong interest. How many of you in here think you're quiet? You'd say, I'm pretty much introverted. Anybody who's an introvert? Okay. Um, it's okay. Um, we're trying to get away from the, the label of introvert, extrovert. The expressive word is more encompassing. It's a sliding scale. This is the Walsh faculty. That 46% of the 26 faculty members that have gone through this emergenetics training would be considered quiet and introspective, and a fourth would be various and talkative. It's probably reflective of students as well. So we have a array of what's going on. So those of you who are teaching or those of you who are experiencing, are you guys, what are your, what's your study area? Are you students? What are you, what's your class? Okay, have you been in a classroom yet? Have you gone any observations? Okay. Yes. Um, for those who have taught, I just want you to think about the first time you ever did something. Just think about that for a second. What don't you do now that you did that first year? You were idea testing. Um, I wasn't sure I'd survive my first year. I was worried because the kids seemed to be really bad. Turned out that three of the kids I had in seventh grade went to prison for various violent crimes. So they were. <laughs> um, but I didn't feel vindicated for about 15 years till they actually got their sentences. <laughs> All right, you can't whine. Who you are is what you are. What you got is that's it. Quit whining about it. This is the beauty of being a Cal Lutheran. This is a faith-based university. We have in the Lutheran Church have a belief that God is perfect. If you're not Lutheran or you're Catholic, they hold the same belief. If you are some other religion, I think they're pretty much close to God is perfect. So however you were made, this is it. Quit whining about it. Take your strengths and use them. All right, positivity. That's my granddaughter on a, on a Ferris wheel. That's a happy kid. That's what we want our students to look like when you're teaching. That's what you want your students to look like. If they can describe your class that way, they go home and they say good things at dinner. You always want them to go home and say good things at dinner. You don't want to be the other dinner conversation. It's really important about teaching K-12. Well. Um, so motivation learning. Again, I'm throwing some things at you before we get this. Uh, Pink says it's mastery, autonomy, purpose. This is a really simple, easy book to read. Um, some different things you can do. He has a TED talk that's easy to watch and it's pretty easy, pretty good. Girls are happy, so we're going to do some things right now to test some positivity. This is from Whole Brain Teaching. However I say class, you say yes. This is participatory now in case you're not sure. So if I say class, you say yes. yes. I say class, class, class. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Hey, class. Yes. 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 No, hey, yes. Hey, class. Yes. Hey, yes. yes. Oh, class. Oh, yes. All right, now look around. You're smiling. Does that seem funny and silly? Yes. I do this with graduate students. I have done this with a room full of professional CPAs, and they laugh too. If I have them laughing, I have, I'm into their limbic system. I have the potential to teach and have them learn. It's a class, yes. It's an attention getter. I have gone to conferences. I watched a fabulous keynote speaker with a thousand piece per and We started timing her. Is it participatory? Her average callback was 45 seconds. My average callback on that is five seconds. If you're teaching, losing 40 seconds can be significant. It's a big deal. Time, bell to bell teaching, that we know it makes a difference. So the class, yes, is this way. See this thing? This is called a scoreboard. I actually made this one. And what this is, I went to a conference and I reversed it. You get these name badges, they work perfectly. I have with me a dry erase marker. If you do something well today, you are the smiley side. I'm going to give you a point. If you get a point, you get to go like this. Oh, yeah. Let's try that. Ready? One, two, three. Oh, yeah. OK, that didn't look all that enthusiastic. I mean, I get a point. So when I got the point, now you get to do a mighty groan that looks like this. So if you do a really good mighty groan, you can bring your point back. Ready? One, two, three. Well, that was good. You get a point for that. If you get a point, you get to do the oh yeah again. Ready? Oh okay. yeah. All right, now, I'm firing neurons in your brain. We're getting these things going. So you just did the mighty oh yeah, the mighty groan, and the scoreboard. 
I'm going to give you a quick story that's in our article about this woman. Give me an old. Cleveland Teachers Union is pretty militant, but they wanted me to come in and work with them. So they had 200 people, or 100 people in the room, two sessions. I'm doing the morning session. You play for non-monetary and substantive things. No candy, no food. You play for, we were going to play for who gets to go to lunch first. If the group won the game, I had somebody in the hall, they would get dismissed for lunch before the other room. If I won the game, they had to wait for the other room to empty. Got it? Point at a time. If they're doing what the students are doing what you want, you give them a point. If the students are doing what not doing what you want, be like this. So I looked here and I said, I didn't see everybody doing something. Because I want to keep the game plus or minus three. I'll write that on here. Because it's not fun if it gets too far away. But if I'm looking at this side of the room, I can honestly say, go plus, minus, three. I can honestly look at these, but I did not see everybody in the room participating. Now the reason for that is I've had six operations on my right eye, I have no peripheral vision. So when I'm looking here, I can't see anybody from here over. This is where it ends. And that's honestly, I'm not making it up. But if I look here, I can see everybody. So I want to look here if I need to create the score closer. Does that make sense? <laughs> Say, ah. <laughs> All right, you're with me. So we use these as a way to get the class. Now what happened with the Cleveland Teachers Union? I'm going through some things. And I'm going to ask you to turn, at one point in time, make a full shoulder turn and face-to-face -to, -face to a partner. And we do this because we know if we're face-to-face, -face, the body engages better by the way your brains are social. You communicate with each other whether you're trying to or not. You have something called mirror neurons. Your neurons, that's why you go to a movie and cry. Because you've got neurons firing because you're seeing something sad, even though it's two-dimensional. And it's not real. And you know that. It's still scary or whatever. So. I watched them, and I saw some people talk this way. So I called, I did class. Yes. yes. And I said, this is a point for me. And I was using a whiteboard, and I ran out of I said, I did not see everybody do a full shoulder turn. Thank you for giving me a point. You might go to lunch second. So I had them do it again. And then what we noticed in this, we put this in our article, the people who did it right the first time sat up straighter. They tried to do a better face-to-face. So when I processed that, I said, I don't understand. Explain this to me. One guy raised his hand. He said, we don't want you to have a point. I said, it's a white line. It's a black line on a whiteboard. He said, yeah, but you would get the point. I said, but it doesn't matter. He said, it matters to us. We don't want you to get the point, and we want to eat first. <laughs> they got to lunch first. They won the game. Second group comes in and said, we heard the other group got to go to lunch first because they won the game. I said, what are we going to play for? Lunch is over. I said, we have to go home first. <laughs> yes! I said, you win the game, you're out before they're out. I win the game, you have to wait till the other room empties and they get to the parking lot first. Okay. Non-monetary. My wife's kindergarten class plays for one minute of extra recess. Kindergarten kids don't even know what it is a minute. <laughs> We've got an extra minute! <laughs> they just want something, they're happy. And it makes a difference in behavior. You can, it, this is a motivator and it's a behavior piece. That makes sense? Okay, good. Let's see what we got here. So part of, it, part of the stimulus response, age-old, class yes, stimulus response. It's a psychology-based, we have some psychology people here, right? Stimulus response. It's old, right? Yes. Stuff works. And that's what this is based on. But we want to create positivity. <laughs> All right, so positive versus negative thoughts, just like you might like to see this, the brain lights up differently when we have things that are happening to us. This was a spec study. And I threw this in, that's my grandson. That's a brain ready to learn. That's not. Leo was the flower or the ring bearer at my daughter's wedding a year ago, and he had an ear infection. And he didn't really want to do anything, so he's crying. And then he put that little pillow on the ground, and he put his sore ear down on it. And he laid, it was so cute, but it was not a good not a good experience. But he's in stress. You've got a bunch of kids crying. Something terrible happens in school. You know, we have these horrors going on around us at the college level, and you see what happened to the junior college in Oregon. And it's very difficult to come in and say, hey, we got to, we're studying ethics today. Something I teach. Okay, let's talk about what happens. What can we do to keep our students more positive and be more observant? Um, the brain lights up differently. 
the quiet introspective brain is the, with the blue lights, and that's the gregarious, talkative brain on the right. We light up differently because we're hardwired differently. It's not your choice, it's how you're made. And what aren't we allowed to do here? No what? No whining. No whining. Give me a, let's hear that. No whining. No, no whining. whining. When your roommate whines, or your friend whines, or your spouse or kids whine, you have to tell them that a graduate of Cal Lutheran from 1975 outlawed whining in your household. <laughs> and they can send me an email, and I'll confirm that that's exactly what I said. <laughs> so again, a couple different pieces of how that looks in different areas of the brain. If you're not familiar with this book and you teach, it's like $9 on Amazon. Carol Dweck is on, you can get on her website. There's the piece. I was talking to Dean Hillis a little bit about this yesterday. When Sig Schwartz told me I should major in English, I didn't think I was smart enough to get a degree in English. I wasn't a particularly good high school student. I struggled with some things when I came here. I got a D in anatomy and physiology. You know, it was just, college was a difficult transition for me. And this strange professor said, you're a good writer, you should be an English major. I was so embarrassed, I didn't want to tell him, no, I'm not. That's fixed mindset. I didn't think I could do it. Dweck says, growth mindset, you believe if I work hard enough and put the time in, I can learn anything, which follows brain and neuroscience research. If we work hard enough, we can learn just about anything. So if you're not good at it now, work at it. This is what I sounded like when I came from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Hey, what are you guys doing over? We're going down to eat dinner now. And I said, why do you talk funny? He said, what do you mean? So it's how you ask questions. I said, what do you mean? He said, you're doing it right now. What am I doing? With your voice. What do you mean? Because in Western Pennsylvania, you've asked a question, like, if I want to go to dinner, I said, go to dinner. It, it cuts words now. It's an efficient speech that we use there. <laughs> but I was so worried, and I used to wash my clothes. Gee, you guys want to go do some laundry, you're going to wash my clothes. What do you mean you're going to wash your clothes? What's washing? I said, you know, soap and you wash things. Then I started going to wash it. I was so worried that I would say wash it. I said, you know, what's the Wednesday work? Wash it. He said, damn, you talk really funny. This was California. Uh, but that's mindset stuff. Believe you can learn it. When I became a teacher in Kent, Ohio, I gave bonus points to kids who would point out words I said funny and grammatical errors. Most people think I'm smart. I'm not. I am good at making people think it. Because I sound like I know what I'm doing. It, it's, it's really important. I mean, you laugh about it, but it's true. I mean, it, it does work. All right, a couple more techniques. And I'm going to have you try some things and talk to each other. It's called the off switch. If you've ever had people working in groups, you've been to a conference, say, would you please turn and talk to your partner? And they say, well, then this was, okay, it's about time, switch. Does the first speaker often always stop when asked to? I see head shaking, no, right? They keep going. And then you hear the professor say, 10 seconds. Oh, your turn. Go ahead. <laughs> Can you get it done in 10 seconds if the other person was supposed to give you a minute? No. So we use the off switch technique. It works like this. I say, class. Yes. yes. And then I say, switch. I want you to reach up. I want you to grab an imaginary string. Pull it down and say, ah, oh, switch. Switch. Oh, switch. Try that again. Class, class? Yes. 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 Switch. Ah, oh, switch. switch. So I'm going to tell my groups, you have, we're doing a cooperative session. Here's the question. I want you to think about it. You have 30 seconds each, 45 seconds each, 60 seconds each. At the middle point, I would call for the ah, uh, switch. Now, when I did this in Traverse City, I had a neuroscientist in the room who stood up and said, that's quite fascinating. That's a neurotransmitter break. I was engaged in a conversation when he did the off switch. I couldn't even remember what I was talking about. <laughs> it's like having a punchline of a joke interrupted by a phone call. <laughs> Give up on it, it's over. So the off switch, and then the other one is called a high five switch. So if you have people in groups, and um, do you know how to high five? You look like you know how to do a high five. <laughs> High five switch like this, I'm watching, I told the students, okay, when it's not time, I want each person in the group, maybe it's triads, to share, and when you get done with your person, or you're done, high five one of your partners, that tells me that they just made a switch. If you finish and you're ready to move on, you can high five her, and go ahead. 
I visually see it as the instructor. I know they're making the switch. So it's a cooperative learning technique, and I used to do training for cooperative learning, Johnson & Johnson's version. We didn't do this because we use Lean In, but that's the hi-fi switch. So I'm going to show you this with Mirror, and we're going to try some things. So class, yes. yes. Mirror, pull your hands up. Whatever I do with my hands, you'll do with your hands. Got that? So I'm going to put, if you put your hands together like this, I want you to wiggle your little finger. I want you to say prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex. Guess what we're talking about right now? The brain, right? Good job. The brain, prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex. Will you say prefrontal cortex? You did it right. Mirror with words. Or magic mirror. Mirror with words. Prefrontal cortex. Wiggle your top fingers and say motor cortex. Motor cortex. And then I want you to wiggle your thumbs and I want you to say visual cortex. Visual cortex. All right, now here's what we're going to do. You're going to turn to a partner. And if you have, it's not even numbers, turn to a person. So we have two, two, two. And then I see three in one row. Um, you could go threes or turn around. I want you to teach your partner prefrontal cortex, which, by the way, on men and women in college is not fully developed yet. That one slide of me with the piece, I had up in there, prefrontal cortex not developed. <laughs> I was 19 when I did that. 25, girls, I have four daughters. Don't trust any man under the age of 25, you want to tell <laughs> They all lie. It's in their DNA, hard drive. And my daughter said, do you like our boyfriends? No. <laughs> number one criteria is I'm going to have a job, and they don't have jobs yet. Well, they want to be nice, that's number two. First, I want them to have jobs. I know, the, I know nice deadbeats. All right, you're going to teach your partner prefrontal cortex, Motor cortex is where you learn to ride the bike and that sort of thing. Visual cortex is where you see things and remember them. Got it? Got it. So turn to your partner. And I'm gonna, this is the last one. It's called Teach OK. I'll do a clap and say OK. You will repeat the clap and say teach. I'll say teach. You say OK. It's like this. Teach. You do OK. okay. Want to try that? Let's go. Ready? Teach. teach. You do OK. Turn and teach it to your partner. You won't do the last way. Sure. OK. <laughs> side of the brain. They discovered that because most people have a stroke, what's affected? Speech, left side of the brain. 
Some people were having strokes, no speech problem, because those areas were on the opposite side. 3% is what the average is. So we have six parts of the brain. We're talk, this is the limbic <laughs> system. Behind, the first one is Warnicus area. In front of it, Broca's area. Turn to your partner, teach your partner the six parts of the brain. And when you're doing it, make gestures towards each other. And you can both talk simultaneously. This is talk time. But explain to your partner. This is prefrontal cortex. cortex. Motor. Motor cortex. Motor cortex. Motor cortex. Visual cortex. Visual cortex. cortex. Limbic system. Limbic system. Warnicus area. Broca's area. Broca's area. Broca's area. <laughs> teach. Everyone else, mm -hmm. 
he didn't want to do it. It's okay. You have to do it. You can leave when you're done today. I would never do these things. I'm uncomfortable. My partner, Alan, when I like to work with him because he is quiet as I'm not. Then, right? I wonder how much do we have that class? And then you'd say yes. yes. That's about how loud it is. And I'm not. So, and it works for whatever your personality is. That's what a neuron looks like. Um, this is really exciting for me when I learned it. How many of you here know things in your gut? You just know it. You feel it in your stomach. Anybody in here ever have butterflies? Mm -hmm. You were nervous, you felt them in your stomach. Have you ever, you know, my stepmother, well, my own mother passed away in particular, I remember. She was only 65, and it was the first death in our family in 25 years since my grandmother had passed. And I remember puking. I remember my brother died of brain cancer in 2007. He lived up in Lafayette, California. Um, I left him, he was in a coma for a week. At 522, I got up out of the bed, I felt like I was gonna throw up. And I came back, I said, I don't know, my stomach's upset. And about 5.40, the phone rings. And they said, your brother passed at 2.22 Pacific time. Yeah. Our brains communicate with each other, whether we know it or not. I don't know how I knew that, but I called my brother in Florida, and he said, I was up around, I felt sick. I don't know, it must have been a quarter after five or so. We all went through an emotional experience. Women who have roomed with people or have sisters, my four daughters menstruate at the same time. Your brains are communicating. You move in with people. It just happens. You have a chemistry. Um, I brought Professor Short something, and it had it was made. It had a birch bark design. I thought he'd like it because he likes Native American literature. He said, "This is amazing." When I was a kid growing up on the shores of Minnesota, of uh, Lake Superior, my favorite tree was the birch tree. Now he and I have always resonated. Sometimes I just know things, and he knows things about me, and I don't know why, but this is part of it. Our guts have neurons that are exactly like the neurons in your brain. They communicate directly to the limbic system. So if you think, ooh, ooh feeling, because you met somebody that makes you give that ooh. Like when my grandkids are born, I'll get that little feeling. It's a gut reaction. It is actual real. You can have gut reactions, and that is actual communication with your brain. It just doesn't have eyes. All right, I did the brain parts. So I'm going to do the gesture. I just want you to call out the part. Okay, we're going to see the gesture of anchor memory. So here, this is the front. More to the area. And then in front of that, broke his area. Limbic system. Visual cortex. Visual cortex. Motor cortex. Prefrontal cortex. Okay, I'm anchoring memories with this. By the way, motor cortex, you know how you ride a bike, you'll never forget? There's a YouTube video about a reverse bicycle. Mm -hmm. If you've not seen it, it's fascinating. Can't do it. The guy had the handlebar reversed, so when he turned the handlebar left, the bike went right. It took him eight months to learn to ride the bike. He took it to college campuses, and the challenge was ride it across the jam of the stage. Not one student ever successfully rode the bike. He put his eight-year-old on it, took his eight-year-old eight like four weeks to learn to ride it. Once he learned it, then he flew to Amsterdam, where they have more bikes than anywhere. Two hours to learn how to remember to ride a bike that he had ridden his entire life before, eight months before. So we do know the brain is hardwired to a degree. By the way, vision trumps everything. Say, vision trumps everything. Vision, vision trumps, trumps everything. everything. Anybody in here remembers names better than faces? Faces <laughs> better than names, sorry. That's all right. Most of us remember, do we remember faces better than names? Yes. yes. You may see me because I wear a bow tie. I did that actually when I became an administrator because little kids could remember who I was. And when we're teaching safety and danger in schools, they knew I was the guy who called snow days. They didn't know anything else about my job. Oh, that's the snow day man. <laughs> By the way, for you native Californian, the snow day. <laughs> <laughs> They're very sought after items back east. Um, the roads aren't safe to drive on. Out here, I think when it rains after several months of drought, the roads are slippery from oil. Uh, maybe it's the same thing, but you know, we don't think it's safe to put children in on buses or in cars, and schools are closed today. So that 3D brain is the free app, and this is a picture from the brain, uh, from that app, and it'll show you things and some of the stuff I talked about. And we were talking about neurons. Uh, this is a thing to be careful with um, <laughs> certain things. Watch out for statistical averages. You know, the thing we did, those of you who came today, the analytical point, just give me facts. Well, 
<laughs> John should be comfortable. That looks like cold and that looks like dry ice. Yeah, well, you know, in the middle, he's about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, yeah. two together. Uh, feedback. So those of you that are going to be teachers, this one at the bottom, this is the brain lighting up when you say praising type things and positive feedback. This is what happens to an eight, nine year old when you do direct criticism. Now direct criticism isn't like negative, it's you need to fix this in order to move on. Yes, good, you fixed it. So you give the constructive feedback first. So we know that eight to nine year olds is this way. Once they get into middle school, it's split. Here's college. If you really want to make a difference for a college student, you give corrective feedback first. If they make the correction, then it's okay. Uh, I teach a legal and ethical course, and my first paper has to be written third person past tense. I generally send back and don't finish reading 90%. 17 students this term in the course, I had one I accepted first time. The rest of them had an intermix of present tense and said, well, it's hard to write the past tense. Well, it is if you've not done it. But the feedback is there's no penalty to correct it in the way I do things. Rick Wormley is a, an advocate of this type of stuff. I've been doing it for a long time. I want them to learn how to write it. So write it again, write it again. Let me work with you. Sometimes it's one-on-one, -on -one and they don't understand past perfect tense and how to use that. So it's an element of when they do action research work, they have to write that in the past tense. They're going to seek publications. Some publications want past tense. The one, the book chapter I wrote, the one of the whole thing in present tense. I found that hard. But, you know, it's what you get used to. But that's corrective feedback. I was a track coach, high school student, making a mistake on how they carry a baton or jump or do something. I corrected it. Do it this way. If they did it right, I praised the correction. I didn't say, geez, Beth, you're a great kid. I'm really glad you're out here running on the relay team. But your handoffs aren't quite right. What happens is Beth hears I'm a great kid. She misses the correction. Does that make sense? It's not harsh. It's just po it's positive because you're constructive. That's brain-based stuff. So gestures. This came out of drum record. I'm going to give you a school law gesture. But first of all, easier one. Physical therapy. This is a gesture they teach. Hold your left hand up, mirror, mirror with words, and say, go tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap, tap. Now, what this is done in physical therapy, if you have a shoulder that's injured and may, range of motion maybe goes to here, but it needs to go to here, they will tap on it and they start making movement of the joint. So when they ask the physical therapist, give me an example of where he is right now, they'll go, well, they're about here. So when the professors assess, the student the physical therapist working on their doctorate have to give that explanation. Go, oh. You can give them the, oh. Good all. That's nice. I'm going to give you a point for that. <laughs> Want to keep the lead to a good mighty oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I didn't see everybody fist pump. I did not see a point for me. Mighty groan. Ready? Uh, good mighty groan. Let me see everybody do a fist pump. One, two, three. Oh yeah. Very good. All right. So school law. When I'm teaching them, I want the students to understand some things about the 5th and 14th Amendment. Fifth Amendment was life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Fourteenth Amendment actually gave it to more people. And then a hundred years later, we started trying to make sure the people got it. But the key elements, balance the scale. So mirror with words, give me you know, justice. Say Fourteenth Amendment. Fourteenth Amendment. 1868. 1868. Gave us life. Gave us life. Touch your heart. Liberty. 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 And the pursuit of happiness. The pursuit of happiness. So it gave us life, life, life liberty, liberty, and the pursuit, pursuit of happiness. Of which which is this? Which is which is Does it trump everything else or no? Yes. And this is? Okay. And this was used for what for, what Physical subject? Physical, Physical therapy. therapy. So this is life, life liberty, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I'm not using words right now. See, what happens is our motor cortex, we're starting to fire things, and what record says, if we explain things with gestures, we anchor memory. So whatever you're teaching to little kids or to college students, if you can think of some gestures, then we can make some inroads. So what we're going to do right now, oh, before I, mistakes. In 
Dweck's book on mindset, we want people to make mistakes. We want to embrace them. That's why when I found this out, it was good meaningful to me, because I've been a screw-up in so many things in my life, that then I made mistakes, and it's meaningful. So, but what we know is if we, we learn from mistakes, that's the biggest way people learn. They screw something up, and they fix it. But if a student in class makes a mistake, we all want to look at the student and say, it's cool. So would anybody like to have an it's cool directed their way? If I need a name, just tell me if you'd like to. Your name? Eric. OK, we're going to pretend like Eric made a mistake. When everybody look at Eric, and I want to say, it's cool, Eric. It's cool, Eric. That's it. Eric made a mistake. We told him it's cool. And for that, because he volunteered, we're going to give him a 10-finger woo. This is a quick party. I want you to point your fingers at Eric. I want you to, I want you to go woo. Ooh. And if you really like it, you can go with the finger and go, ooh. Uh, another variation of this is called the ten finger rolling woo. Ooh. Would somebody like to receive a woo right now? If you think that would be nice to get one? Hey, hey. Anybody volunteer right? Yeah. Okay, your first name is Haley. This is Haley. We're going to give Haley a ten finger rolling woo. Ready? Ooh. Now, oh, if it's something small, you can give a pinky woo. And it looks like this. Woo. <laughs> okay, we're going to give uh, Dr. Brennan a pinky woo. Ready? Woo! woo. Um, you know, and Dean Hillis is new to the campus this year. What kind of woo does he deserve for being, for leaving Pacific Lutheran? <laughs> Rival. And coming here, improving his life by coming here, I think he, what kind of woo? Anybody? A ten finger woo? Okay, make your fingers in. Woo! Alright, so we use these quick in class reinforcement. Somebody gets that if they make a mistake, we turn and say, it's cool. Um, when Chris Biffle of Whole Brain Teaching did this, I've watched teachers use it. Kids will try things, it's non threatening. They do celebrations for people who try and make mistakes. Yes, you messed up, that's so good. The papers I sent back, do you know the average I have to have people repeat it down the road? They don't, they got it. Once they get it the first time, when they take the course, the capstone course, and they have to write an action research project, they don't mess it up. I'm not correcting tense anymore. So, so I give you the gestures for school on physical therapy. Think about this for a second. Can you tell what Bill Russell is thinking there? We can start to read people. Does he seem somber or not? We know. This was Sir Ferguson. That's the chief of police in Ferguson. What do you think? What kind of mood is he in? Because you need to have an ability to take a look at people and get an idea. How about Scarlett? Happy. You know, pretty excited. In that case, five year old. What that couple? Aww. See, that's the awe feeling, right? We can say, ah. Yes. <laughs> that's the real Eiffel Tower. I'd never been to Europe before, but my daughter's marrying a young man from the UK, and his grandparents were from France, so um, it was nice. And I actually learned to go order bread in French. So I talked about this before, the how we express things. I'm going to slide over, because the QRST is another technique. It's built off think pair share but the key is the structure. And I'm getting down because we're going to do this one, and I want to make sure we have time to do it. You ask a question. You allow people a certain amount of time to think. Zakrasik uh, from North Carolina and Jeannie Lowe, they did a 30, 60, 90. They gave adults 30 seconds to think. It's too long for most, definitely too long for K-12 kids. I find that 15 seconds is plenty for most of my class students, unless we're really thinking about something deep. But you give them a certain amount of time to think. Then the share is done with an off switch. And then you share the test. The idea is explaining it to the classroom. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to think about anything I've covered today, anything we've talked about that you think has value or not value. You share that. You're going to have 10 seconds to think about it. You will then have 15 seconds to share. I'll call for an off switch. You will switch with your partner. And then the other person will get 15 seconds. And then we'll talk about the room, which this can be used at any level, with any technique. Got it? Anybody need clarification? You'll get 10 seconds to think about the question. You will get 15 seconds to share each. We'll do an off switch, and then we'll share out the room. Got it? Class? Yes. yes. I want you to take 10 seconds to think right now. 
What have you, anything we've talked about today that has value or you want to talk about with your partner? Go. <clears throat> Before I have you switch, one other thing. If you don't like to go first, I want you to give a signal to your partner, either the number two or your thumb up in the air because you'd like to go second. This is really to help the first introverted type person. And it doesn't matter. One of you have to decide who goes first. I don't do it any other way. But give a signal who's going to go first. So the first person, you have 15 seconds. Clap. I'm going to do a teach okay. Model that. Teach. First person, go. Okay. Fifteen seconds. Yes, yes, yes. Switch. switch. Yeah, I think Would anybody like to share out of her? I'm sort of moving past this because I use up some of the time. Anybody like to share with the class? No, I'm doing this for a reason. For those of you in, in that this is maybe repetitive, we know from brain research that when people talk about an idea, they do not have to share it with the teacher. If you are teaching young ones, my wife had morning meeting, kindergartners. This was a technique. She, she loved me for a lot of reasons. She really loved me for this one. You come in on Monday morning, instead of, oh, guess what happened to me? My grandpa's cat died. Oh, my dog was puking. You know, they start, everybody has to tell stories. I want you to, you're going to have 30 seconds to share with your partner something important that happened this weekend. She did the off switch. 30 seconds in one minute, every kid shared. And they said, well, if you want to talk to me, we'll talk at recess. And that was it. It was over. They had talked about it. So when people talk, I'm not saying you have to share out because you've already done it. Would anybody like to share something with the group? Mm -hmm. I'll share. Please. Um, last week I was in New Orleans for a conference, and I got to meet Sonia Nieto, who is one of the reasons why I became a teacher. So it was great to actually meet her and hear her speak and talk to her. So I was really inspired by that. Cool, excellent. Someone else? Something you like to, and then we talked about it, you've done or you thought about, please. The gestures, they seem kind of silly sometimes when we're doing them, but they really do help. Like, I can tell you all the parts of the brain right now. <laughs> <laughs> cool, like I, all of the gestures, so really good. And what are these called? Dendrites. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my, oh. Uh, myelin sheath. And the myelin sheath, the axon, and Tons. how do they fire? Snapchat. Snapchat. It's, it's Snapchat. strange. Create gestures for your content and I'll remember more. Anyone else? Something you'd like to share? Yes? I was going to say um, the power of unconscious thinking you were talking about, like thinking with your gut, basically, or dealing with your gut. There's a lot of research in social cognition that suggests that when there's a lot of information to process, it's not necessarily best to think through the pros and cons of everything, but perhaps use unconscious thinking. So think about something else and coming back to your gut feeling on that. Yeah, they say sleeping on it actually, that's a real phenomenon. You should sleep on it. You'll have better ideas the next day. Anyone else? Um, what I would normally do is, if I would ask you to do a three minute pause, but we're sort of out of the three minutes. Three best <laughs> ideas for today. You can do this on your own. Two babies, one question. I will tell you that I, uh, this I think is nice. Remember we said no whining. Here's why you shouldn't whine. Because you are unique and created beautifully, just like you're supposed to be. Your part in this world is taking your strengths and turning them into something spectacular. And the only limitation is what you place in yourself. And I've experienced that both as a teacher and a parent, and through hard work and perseverance, it's amazing what you can do. Um, and from my, so that's my house. Um, that's the burning bush is about started, just starting to turn red. That was last year. Uh, we just had 16 trees removed because of the emerald ash borer. And if you want to get a hold of me, that's my email address. I do respond. Um, I want to thank you. I'm here if you have any questions. But uh, if you need the handout, um, both Sia and Beth can provide that for you. And uh, again, I, it's my humble honor to be able to come back to my alma mater and share with you. So thank you for being here.